Side-scrolling beat-em-ups need to have loads of enemies in them, otherwise they'd be about 10 minutes long. Sadly, you can't just recolor everyone or make the player fight evil clones of themselves forever, and believe me, they tried. That's how we ended up with bizarre boss designs that are surely the result of a late night, a looming deadline, and way, way too many cups of coffee. Consider these our eight favorites. In Streets of Rage 2, the sinister crime lord Mr. X has returned to take control of the city, which is bad news if you were thinking of visiting the amusement park because it's now full of angry punks and someone broke all the arcade machines. You also won't be able to visit the park's haunted house, which is probably for the best, because whoever imagineered it misread the brief that asked for a fun, spooky mansion and instead created the kind of alien-heavy walkthrough attraction that would give HR Geiger nightmares. I wouldn't eat that chicken if I were you. Anyway, it's here in the weird alien house that you first meet Verhelitz, who is an alien head on a spring. I would be inclined to say it's an animatronic, but then again it shrieks in pain every time you punch it, so… Axel, if this is genuine first contact with an alien race, you are making a terrible impression. Possibly even weirder than Verhelitz, however, is Zamza, the boss of the alien house who looks a lot like Blanca and Vega, decided to put their life of fighting behind them and start a family together. I have so many questions about Zamza. Why does he have claws? Is that a wig? What was he doing in the ceiling? Do him and Verhelitz hang out together when there aren't any vigilantes around? Well, I'm not going to get any answers now. Thanks a lot, Axel. The second stage of Final Fight takes place in a subway station, so you might expect the boss of the level is going to be some kind of violent ticket inspector, or possibly an angry train you need to punch until it derails. So it comes as something of a surprise to find yourself walking into a pro wrestling ring to face a guy called Sodom, a nickname whose origins we're content to never have learned. Sodom is, we're told, an American Japanophile, but instead of just signing up for a Crunchyroll subscription like the rest of us, Sodom went one step further and is never seen without his mostly accurate samurai getup. I guess he forgot his samurai trousers today, which is why he's turned up wearing jeans. Before you show up, Sodom is on an undefeated streak, which sounds impressive until you realize that, this being an underground wrestling promotion, Sodom is able to get away with more rule-bending shenanigans than your average WWE superstar, including wearing that armor throughout the match and, oh yeah, using two massive swords. Come on, referee! Oh right, there isn't one. That wasn't the last we saw of Sodom. He turned up in the Street Fighter Alpha series where he could mostly be found bothering sumo wrestlers to join his gang and practicing his Japanese. It's not going super well. In 1989's Revenge of Shinobi was legally required to release as four different versions during the time that it was on sale because the developers just couldn't stop including licensed characters in their game. First, there was the enemy that was clearly Rambo. Then this guy, who starts as the Incredible Hulk and finishes up as the Terminator in a copyright infringement twofer. Then, in a turn of events that might seem odd to anyone expecting a normal side-scrolling beat-em-up, out comes Godzilla, looking for a fistfight. The strangest enemy of all, however, is the boss of Round 6, who is Spider-Man. Not a guy dressed as Spider-Man or an enemy with Spider-Man's powers, but actual Peter Parker, guy from the comic book Spider-Man, who has, for some reason, decided to take the side of international crime syndicate neo Zed. In the Japanese version of the game, this is even weirder as the character starts out as Spider-Man until you do him enough damage, at which point, in a move straight out of crossover fanfiction, he transforms into Batman. I think it's clear at this point that the revenge of the title is being taken against international copyright law. Speaking of Spider-Man, The Amazing Spider-Man vs. The Kingpin was a 1991 game in which Spider-Man aimed to defeat the Kingpin by fighting a number of his most famous enemies, including Venom, Sandman, Dr. Octopus, and the Lizard. 
He also at one point fought a gorilla for reasons never adequately explained. The first part of the game's Central Park level involves you kicking a load of snakes to death. You know, standard Spider-Man stuff. Get past these hissing bodyguards, however, and suddenly a massive gorilla drops down from the trees and starts beating the webbing out of Spidey like, well, a confused and frightened wild animal probably would. Why is this happening? Did the gorilla escape from the zoo, or is it part of a hitherto undiscovered group of New York gorillas trying to assert their dominance? Did the gorilla just see Spider-Man kill all those snakes and is out for revenge? One thing's for certain, popular superhero Spider-Man is going to have to punch a gorilla to death. Maybe don't take a photo of that for the Daily Bugle, Peter. Cadillacs and Dinosaurs is set in a distant future in which dinosaurs have returned and shirts don't do up properly. Following what is possibly the most efficient setup in video game history. You and your chosen character must get to the bottom of why dinosaurs are turning violent and why human dinosaur hybrids have started appearing across the city. And by get to the bottom of, I mean punch people until you find out it's a mad scientist. When you finally catch up to the scientist in question, Dr. Simon Fessenden, he, in a move we probably should have seen coming, immediately turns into a dinosaur. Beat him up enough and the good doctor transforms into a second form which he describes as the perfect creature. All the strength of a dinosaur with his fearsome intellect. And th throw in a couple of extra dinosaur heads too, why not? You know, I think it's actually going to be harder to take over the world looking like that, mate. For a start, how are you going to fit through doors? And now you've got three mouths to feed. Also, did you know you're still vulnerable to flying kicks? See? The Simpsons game that hit arcades in 1991 took a few liberties with the beloved show, but in most respects was completely faithful to such pillars of Simpsons canon as Lisa's catchphrase, Embrace Nothingness, Most Tavern having an arcade, live jazz and a roulette table, and of course, Smithers' trademark cape full of bombs and gruff British accent. Welcome to my world. <laughs> Weirdest of all, though, was that the final boss of the game was Mr. Burns. Now, I know what you're thinking, Mr. Burns is going to be a super easy last boss. He's a million years old and will crumble to dust the second you touch him. But that's before you see him crash through a wall in a giant robot suit and deliver his famous catchphrase, Welcome to your grave, suckers, in a gruff British accent. Welcome to your grave, suckers. For someone who has worked in nuclear power their whole life, Monty Burns isn't super up on his basic safety protocols. He launches mini atomic warheads at the Simpsons in his office, which, while spacious for an office, is still very much not what you would call minimum safe distance. So it's up to the Simpsons to wail on Monty, gradually kicking his robot suit to pieces before finally it is destroyed, revealing that this whole time, Mr. Burns was, wow, massive. He's got to be eight feet tall. Oh, also he's dead now, I guess. Good night, sweet Monty. How we'll miss your gruff British accent. <laughs> Mutation Nation was a 1992 arcade game from SNK which told the story of a terrible genetic virus that escapes from a mad scientist's lab. When this virus infects the local population, it turns them into fearsome mutants, and so it's up to plucky local youth, Ricky Jones, to beat them all to death. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Some of them, yeah, sure, you're probably doing them a kindness, like these dudes with the squids for faces, or this guy who looks like a pork rind wearing lycra, but I'm pretty sure this four-armed lady is just trying to enjoy a dance. Ricky, how about live and let live? That's your answer to everything, Ricky. The weirdest boss to our mind, however, has to be this levitating psychic jerkbag that you encounter at the end of Area 5. He looks like Quark from Star Trek DS9, has a big eye in his head and immediately splits into two so he can be twice as annoying with the spare one levitating rocks around and generally being a massive distracting nuisance. You can still punch them though as Ricky obviously immediately discovers. Ricky? 
What are you pointing at? Is anyone else worried about Ricky? Back to Streets of Rage for our final kooky boss, only this time it's Streets of Rage 3, which introduced new moves, multiple endings, and new character Zan, who is an old man robot. It was the 90s. Old man robots were all the rage, I expect. It also introduced some truly bizarre enemies for you to fight, including old-timey samurai and terminators and slacks, but the most bizarre was a boxing kangaroo named Rue and his trainer Bruce. For a start, let me make it clear that we're not in a circus level or anything here. This boss fight takes place in Area 2, known as City Streets. City Streets being not somewhere you would usually expect to find a fighting kangaroo and his trainer, who, might I add, appears to be some kind of robot clown with a whip. Choose to spare Rue and instead focus on his cruel trainer, and Rue is so grateful for having been freed from his life of servitude that he joins your team and becomes a playable character when you next use a continue. Or, I mean, geez, Blaze, didn't you used to be a cop? What next? Beating up people trying to enjoy a night out dancing in a club? Have you met Ricky Jones, Blaze? I think you two would get on. That's all we've got time for today, which is a shame because I didn't even get around to Greener Bobo from Double Dragon. Why is he green? We'll never know, but if you've got any other favourites, drop them in the comments below and be sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this from Outside Xbox. Thanks for watching!